exactly what it is. And that. Got it. Okay, okay, got it. Um, Noah and I had a little bit of a miscommunication. <laughs> wake up everybody gets here. Sorry. I don't want that stupid belt. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Um, Nola had thought maybe I would show slides or clips and I didn't hear, I mean, I didn't know that, but the fact is that I'm not a big fan of showing film clips. Number one, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> I haven't mastered the technology, but mainly it's just, I don't like taking film out of context. I think with the, the whole film, it just, it just it gives a false, false representation of the film. Um, so I'm just going to talk. So I wanted to say that I would love for you to just jump in with questions and don't wait till the end. Come in with questions, but try to keep it on point um, it, while I'm talking, whatever I'm talking about at that moment. And then at the end, you can just ask anything you want to. But I want you. I want it to be more like a conversation. OK, it'll be a little one sided, I know. But so here goes. Um, I was struck, but I don't know if any of you saw there were two pieces in The Times yesterday. One was an um, op-ed piece by Michelle Goldberg about this woman who's writing about, you know, the big word was sex positivity for women there for a while. Now it turns out that sex positivity is not all that positive. And women are sort of looking again at it because of this so-called liberation ended up with more kind of shame and embarrassment and not you know, a sort of singular lack of feeling and all the things that that, that were supposed to liberate and, and enhance women's sexual lives apparently are not doing that. And I think part of it is because somehow sex always seems to be on men's terms. And I think part of it is, we can get into that a little bit later, that women almost want it that way. I mean, they want to be pursued. They don't, I mean, some get, are into pursuing, but maybe a lot aren't. So it's a very complex thing, but I, I just thought that was fascinating that there's a kind of backpedaling now on one of the prime kind of precepts of feminism of the last 30 years. The other was the piece, the Times occasionally do, will sort of do a re-examination of a film, and usually it's a kind of a serious film and it's a gateway to looking at the director's other work. This time it was on basic instinct um, I, I think the title was a time capsule that still has the power to shock. And I, I think probably most of you have seen it. I mean, it was it was a while back, but not that long ago um, with Sharon Stone as the les rich lesbian, oh, bisexual, rich bisexual, best selling author. <laughs> That's a real combo. That's what we're all looking to be um, with Michael Douglas as this sort of schlubby detective. And at the time, it was it was uh, Paul Verhoeven who loves to sort of provoke and scandalize, and it was a, a big scandal. And it still is one of the raciest films ever. There's a famous scene with Sharon Stone showing more than she means to show in a police interrogation. Um, but th th what was interesting is he quoted at the right at the Times writer quoted at the end two reviews in the Village Voice. I guess I had gone by that time, but there were two reviewers because there was a lot of LGBT active, uh, you know, uh, gay activists were protesting the film because of the treatment of the lesbian that not so much the Sharon Stone character, but another lesbian was treated shabbily, or maybe it was the Sharon. Stone. Anyway, there was a lot of uh, protests and vocal protests against it. But then Amy Tobin, who's a very much a feminist critic, wrote a positive review and said she thinks it's a gas to see a woman so much in control of her life and so forth. So you had two absolutely opposite points of view on this film. And it's like, it's one of the things I wanna talk about is why it's, a da it's dangerous. Well, let me just say first, let me introduce something else first. Um, my book From Reverence to Rape was coming out in 73, 74. And at the same time, in fact, I was in England and that was at um, the theater and it was in, I saw it in some kind of quarterly. It was an essay by a woman named Laura Mulvey, an academician who's been in the States now for many years. And it was called Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. And it was about, the, the, the she used the word gaze, the male gaze, that's G-A-Z-E. And it's become a kind of buzzword now. It's used in, in just the popular press and everywhere. But the idea was, the presumption was that the movie going, movie viewing was entirely sort of the, the, the viewer was male and the, the object of his 
viewing was female. It was the, the, the female was completely objectified in cinema and the male was the, the, sub, the subject and the female was the object. And now we use the word agent. The women didn't have agency. But first of all, it's just not true, you know? I mean, there is a lot of that. There is a lot of uh, sort of sexist iconography in movies, but there's also a lot more going on besides. And one of my points has always been, I think it's dangerous to take, uh, to look at film through a lens of a, a kind of strict political ideological lens because it just doesn't, there's no way it can capture the, the multiplicity and the complexity of films. And also the fact that we don't necessarily always identify with our gender. I mean, I would grow up and identify with cowboys or whatever, and men are often very often identify with them. And so the whole process of seeing movies and identifying is, is much more complicated than that. Um, so that, so I was writing at this time and there really was, um, Oh, and I wanted to say, so it's, I think to, to view film in terms of gender is it's just too crude an instrument. Um, and also there are different values in different eras. We have to take that into account and not complete, not always. And we do this a lot now, I think. And it's one of the things that I object to is see everything in the past through our enlightened eyes of the present, whereas you know things were very different then and have to be seen in, in those terms. And also the context of the film, the zeitgeist, what it what it's playing off of, the social and political world that it's embedded in. I mean, no film is 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 isolated. It belongs to a whole a com complex kind of landscape of other films. Um, it, what, something strange happened. At the time my book came out was something was going on in Hollywood which was that somehow through some financial fluke, money was freed up. The, the studios were sort of floundering, but they had money. And all of a sudden there were these hot new independent directors who wanted to make movies. There were people like, you know, Coppola and Cassavetes and Altman and De Palma and eventually Scorsese. So all of a sudden these what would have been considered almost European, not, not The Godfather, but a lot of the others were European type films were being made with Hollywood money. And it was a very exciting moment. Um, the emphasis was on, on youth. It was, in fact, it's almost too much so, I think. I think it had unintended consequences down the road, this obsession with youth, but that's another story. But movies like The Graduate and Bonnie and Clyde, um, the, the, the feminists who weren't cinephiles or weren't that interested in film, like some of the people at Miz, and I wrote for Miz and I, I got along fine with them, but they, their idea was, I mean, they, they thought my book was a bit strange because they thought, because I had I applauded all these great films of the past and they thought, oh my, that can't be, you know, the, the, these awful patriarchal studio heads and this the, treating actors like slaves and women particularly, and surely now in this great new era, we're gonna have better women. But in fact, a little bit, the converse was true because on, in the studio system, they had to, first of all, they liked women, the studio heads. I mean, they may have behaved badly from time to time, but they basically liked women. They wanted to see women in films. They didn't want them just a male cinema. Um, and, they, and they had to, they were, they were making films for women audiences. But but when when Cassavetes and 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 this is to say and this is not to say anything against their films, but they felt no obligation to use women. They they weren't they didn't have to please a female audience. They could make personal films, and very often they were about male groups and male problems. And so, so ironically, with this great new explosion, I mean there there are exceptions because there were a lot of Paul Mazursky did great films with women and Altman, and so they were. But there was this suddenly they didn't need to use women in the way that they had before and they could ignore whatever was left of the female audiences and audience was beginning to fragment too. Um, there were all these buddy films, you, if anybody goes back that far, like Robert Redford and Paul Newman were playing together more than either one of them did with any, any women. And they were the cop duos, all these sort of um, types of film, genres of film that were really about men and male action. <clears throat> but I came across, I was looking, um, when I wrote, I wrote an inter a new introduction to a third edition of the film that came out a few years ago. And I went back and looked at what 
some of the, the theory people, not the regular people had said about um, my book. And they said, well, this and that is, you know, they gave me points for this and not for that. But she, one of them said, <clears throat> the, critic, um, the problem with the book was that Haskell was, is an uncritical celebrator of heterosexual romance. <laughs> So, so I thought, yeah, well, I guess I am. Well, first of all, that was pretty much the only kind there was then. We didn't have much in the way of gay romances and um, it was mostly white, you know, the whole thing. But I think you see, there's a lot that is, can be seen about, the, about women's evolving roles and it doesn't have to do with whether they actually have professions or not. It's something else altogether. I um, mean, of course, it, some of it, uh, I use an example. There's a movie called The Moon's Our Home in the 30s with Margaret Sullivan and Henry Fonda. And she's an actress and she meets him in there in New York. He's this Park Avenue socialite. And they fall in love and they're going to marry and live in New York. And then suddenly she just can't do it. So she races and goes to, it was called Idlewild. JFK was called Idlewild. She goes to Idlewild Airport and she's getting on this plane to go to California. And suddenly, Fonda has commandeered an ambulance and a medico and they come and grab her off the ramp of the plane and put her in, and she's in this kind of ambulance in the back and she's got on a sort of straight jacket and she's looking up at Henry Fonda in this sort of submissive bliss and I mean that's a kind of uh, extreme example of, of what was going on this was the way the romance ended but of course partly <coughs> that was a convention just like Shakespeare's comedies that end with marriage and happiness. And often there was another message that was going on at the same time. So for instance, that, I mean, here's this woman that really, you know, look what she's given up. And it was written by Dorothy Parker and Alan Campbell, who were a real life couple and, and not particularly domestic. So, I mean, I don't think they had a sort of June moon marriage. Um, but what I, I wanted, I loved, uh, they were movies like the film noir and screwball comedies, which were, I mean, it was, uh, the production code came in, films were sort of very racy until about 1934. And then suddenly the public was ex just protesting the, the sexiness. And it was partly what people in Hollywood were doing. It was just, just such immorality and, and uh, you know, philandering and all of that. And this was in films too. So all of a sudden the production code was a, a group of people in Hollywood, but they were speaking for the public and they would, they would censor films. So all of a sudden the sexy dames of the early thirties were out. And what happened was though, that there was more of an emphasis on, first of all, on talk. Um, before they would, this sensu the sensuality was sort of the focus and now it was talk. So you had things like screwball comedies where with brilliant scripts and also all of these, because movies had become talkies in the 30, all of these great playwrights were coming to Hollywood like Ben Heck to write scripts. So there were these fantastic byplay where women gave as good as they got. And this was screwball comedy. And even the endings, you know, I was looking I'm a big fan of Howard Hawks. I don't know if you've seen any of his films. His Girl Friday, Bringing Up Baby. Um, you know, there, there are also uh, The Red River. There are also Westerns. He made something in almost every every kind. But just taking these two, because Cary Grant's in both of them, and I love them. And the, the rap against Hawks was at the, because this was also the beginning, the 60s and 70s of film courses. Um, that the rap against him was that he didn't know how to do endings. And it's true, if you look at the ending of His Girl Friday, where the, the, his, the star newspaper reporter and the editor, Rosalind Russell and Cary Grant are reunited, but he's, he, instead of going to Niagara Falls that she's been wanting to do for, they didn't have a, they were divorced because he wouldn't take her on a honeymoon. Now they're remarried and she thinks she's going to Niagara Falls and suddenly a big story breaks nearby, near Niagara Falls and they're gonna do that. So you, you they're sort of running out and, and he's, I think she has to, uh, he, he makes her open the door for him, but it's just a sort of role reversal that's very funny. And in fact, there's a lot that goes on in the film that only Cary Grant could get away with, but um, it's, it, it's ambiguous as is the ending of, um, uh, 
um, the one other one I mentioned. Uh, anyway, that takes place in Connecticut, and she's and it was Catherine Hepburn and the and the tiger. And in the end, he's he's up. He's a paleontologist, but he's up on top of the structure of this dinosaur, and he's going back and forth. She's just sort of wrecked his life. But he said, "I never had so much fun in my life." And they're obviously going to get together, but you don't. Again, you don't necessarily feel that it's ha happy ever after. It's okay. It's 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 going to be. The vitality, the eros, is the fighting in a way, the, the bickering and the fighting. So, I mean, people talk about the saccharine happy endings, and they just, they really, a lot of them, they really aren't that. You get the sense that the couple is going to bring up baby as the title, is the baby is this tiger. Oh, God, I forgot to turn off my phone. Oh, well, you don't mind. I had to listen to all the doorbells ringing. So, um, Emily's list, oh God, they never give up. Um, so I was writing about film uh, from a feminist angle and nobody really, it was the that moment of the women's movement was coming into its own, but they really hadn't started, at least the, the critics that I knew and I was belonged to these critics groups weren't looking at them from a feminist angle and I was, but on the other hand, I didn't want to be pigeonhole as an ideologue. So if people would ask me how I describe myself, I would say I'm a, femi a, a film critic first and a feminist second, because I did not want to be kind of constrained by, by uh, ideology. I wanted to be able to embrace the contrariness and the contradictions. Um, just to, I want to, I'm sort of going to bring it up to date now, but I would just in insert here one thing that sort of illustrates this to me, was a great illustration of this, of our mixed feelings about movies and how, how they should be seen as legitimate. Uh, Turner Classic Movies, was have, they have a festival every year in California and Los Angeles and they show, it's a, I'd only, this is the first time I've been, they show a lot of, of sort of fairly obscure old movies and they have panels and it's a lot of fun. I mean, some of these people, I couldn't get over just standing in line for some of these early Hollywood movies. And these people knew every character actor, every, I mean, they knew so much, so much more than I did. I was just blown away. But anyway, so they had planned this panel on Gone with the Wind. I had written a book for Yale University Press. They do these different series and this was American icons. And I did one on Gone with the Wind. Um, and so at this, that we're gonna discuss it. And it was Donald Bogle was the, uh, the MC. He's a, a very well-known and excellent black film historian. And there was a black woman producer. And then there was a black academic, wonderful woman named Jacqueline Stewart, who now is on Turner Classic Movies, introducing movies a lot. She wasn't then. So we were going to talk about Gone with the Wind. <clears throat> and I knew because I had had this experience when I mean, we know how horrible it is. Actually, it, the slavery in a way, and it is not as bad as the portrait of Reconstruction, which is really a blasphemy against what was going on. I mean, it's very obviously um, Southern, completely the Southern point of view, and it's a kind of false point of view. But um, I had known when the book came out, I had done a radio show and the people would call in and so this woman called in and she's self-identified as black and she started ranting she says this this movie and the book should be on the dustbin of history but she kept going on and on about it about this thing and that thing in it and I said well how many times have you seen it and she said oh about 500 so so I thought and I, and it turned out that these two women these two black women that I was on the panel with also had what, what happens is they respond to Scarlett it's not that they're not identifying with Mammy they're responding to the spirited woman who represents all women who've had to pull things together when the husbands were away at war, when the men, when there was no man, you know, the woman on her own and the, the gutsy spirited character they all identified with. And it, it reminded me of Leslie Fiedler has a book on several, I guess, on American pop culture, but he talks about how we can we can dislike a film on political or ideological grounds and still respond to it emotionally. And I think that this to me says so much about a great many films that we have mixed feelings about. And so I'm, I'm ne this, this was, I've never been for just canceling a film. I mean, there's some that may be just too impossible to show right now, but for the most part, I think 
show them and put them in context. And I think the problem is that this is this idea that we don't want to see anything that's going to make us uncomfortable. But why? Why shouldn't we be uncomfortable? Is my thinking. Why shouldn't we, um, you know, have to deal with our own mixed emotions that art or popular culture uh, elicits from us? So that's kind of my point of view. And um, I'm going to go into sort of more recent years. So obviously the situation did improve. I mean, after all those male buddy films, we finally got some female buddy films like Thelma and Louise. And uh, Nola reminded me yesterday of, um, what was it? Uh, the, in, what was it, Nola? The Impossible, Outrageous Fortune with Bette Midler and Shelley Long. A very funny buddy, female buddy film. And all these great actresses came along, Meryl Streep and Faye Dunaway and Glenn Close and uh, Jessica Lange. And I mean, and they're still going. Most of these women are still going and, and also aged. I mean, the film is usually not forgiving for age, but somehow some have managed, like Charlotte Rampling appeared a few years ago as a 65 year old woman in a movie called 45 Years. Um, so I think it's it's been, uh, I mean, it's just astonishing now how many women there are. And those, of course, both of those two films that I mentioned were written by women. And we've got, when then we've had long, form, a lot of women are in long form television, like Girls, Lena Dunham, and a lot of things that have been like, what is it called? Um, broads, the, the broad, broad something. Another really funny bu women buddy series. Broad City. Broad City, thank you. <laughs> in, in Brooklyn, these Females. Yep. <laughs> um, maybe I should just take a pause here because I've got some other thoughts, but they sort of veer in a slightly different direction. Anybody want to tune in? Okay, no. Phone volume is good. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Always good to have the technical stuff working. I would just say that um, I think your point is really an interesting one. I've never really thought about it that way, about a film like Gone with the Wind, which is on so Obviously. many levels, yeah. so problematic. And yet, you know, I've enjoyed watching that film too, you know, and I think when you point that out, that we, as I guess, as human beings, you know, we respond to character and people Mm -hmm. So then you're watching something that, you know, like you yeah. say, you're identifying with this character and, you know, the whole thing of her or, you know, or the way that as a woman, I identify with many male roles. Right. In the exactly. I, I love I, the film. And yeah. I watch yeah. it again and again. And, yeah. You know. Well, my and husband, it, Andrew Saris, was a film critic and he loved women in film. In fact, that was one of that's one of the things that I want to say something after that about what, what you said. Contradict. But um. One of the problems, somebody was making a big case for C Steven Spielberg recently that people don't take him seriously. He's just as good as somebody. I mean, he's a he's a brilliant filmmaker. It's just that the, the his films are usually a ch ch childhood fantasies, um, ex when, except for Schindler's List and things like that. Although I happen to like West that story, but I think the problem is that they just don't deal with grownups, you know. And I like films about grownups. It's as simple as that. It's not about his technique. It's it's not about um, I don't think he's been, I don't think he's been uh, underrated. I think if anything, he's been, I mean, he was a while before he got an Oscar. So I, I, in that, in that way that he was maybe not quite accepted as serious and important, but I think I was going to say that I, it, it's, it was striking me thinking about this today, this whole emphasis on the youth culture in the sixties and seventies and sort of the Vietnam war and the, there was a lot of kind of self-pity in that too. But anyway, that, that adults were all hypocrites and they'd gotten us into this mess. It was sort of this, suddenly this big the divide. And I think in a way that Spielberg and Lucas and Star Wars and all come out of this, of not trusting adults, of, of sort of, you know, it's not, de not dealing with adult subjects, staying, staying, staying a kid forever. And I mean, that's his, his, his his explicit aim is to appeal to the child and all of us. And he often does. I mean, he knows how to, to get to you with something like E.T. I was just watching that again recently. But I think that there was a shift to 
even as we were getting these really interesting independent films, we suddenly with Star Wars and with Jaws and then Close Encounters, suddenly sci-fi was big time. Sci-fi had been like pulp before. It was always B movies. And now suddenly it was big budget and it was multiplexes and it was, you know, kids seeing it over and over again. It really changed the movie industry. I mean, we, we've seen that it's now Marvel, you know, the, the Marvel event ad infinitum, all these, all these um, uh, franchises that just go on and on forever, but still, I mean, in between, and I think in a way, this is where I think so much of adult narrative is, is in, in long form television, this in series. Um, that's where, I mean, I think about prime suspect, Helen Mirren was like the first female detective, you know, and now the female detectives all over the place. And, you know, a lot of barriers. Oh, I know the thing, one thing I was going to say is um, we have to, this is sort of pertains to Gone with the Wind and a lot of other films too. It's, it's our ambivalence. It's like, there's a contradiction sometimes between our forward thinking, uh, aspirational, egalitarian selves and the dark fantasies. I mean, people have dark fantasies, you know, they really do. And um, they have, uh, whether they're conscious or unconscious fantasies, they're pulled maybe by things they shouldn't be pulled by, the things that aren't in their interest. So I think we just have to accept that and accept that there's not going to be a kind of programmatic cinema. And even if there was, I think what's interesting about that Michelle Goldberg piece is I'm sure women are going to disagree about that. This whole, I mean, I hate these terms, but sex positivity, sex negativity. Um, I think they're probably just uh, a, a whole you know, myriad of po points of view or perspectives on that. So that's always been my thing. And that's what um, keeps me excited. And then I was gonna talk a little bit, but I'd like to stop here for any, any other questions now or thoughts. I mean, you don't have to ask a question. I thought, thoughts would be fine. Um, we can talk, I thought we'd talk a little bit about the, the good films this year. Um, maybe say that to the end since the Oscars are coming up. Um, but I, I was going to say one thing. I did a piece recently for Sight and Sound, um, British film magazine about, I had mentioned, and I think it was in my 10 best list. They had seen there were three films. Well, I didn't love all these films, but there were three films. One was, I don't know if you, you may not have seen them any or maybe one or two. Um, the Worst Person in the World, uh, a Norwegian, a wonderful Norwegian film um, it, about this woman who's flailing and flailing and doesn't know what she wants to do and tries all these different things. And there's another one, Mia Hansen Love is a French director. She did one called Bergman Island about a woman director with her lover, partner, male director, who's sort of more uh, successful and advanced than she is. And they're both in, in Bergman's Island. And it's really interesting about Ingmar Bergman, but she's sort of resenting the fact that Bergman had, I think something like, I can't remember the figure, but like six children from four different women. She said, I don't want, I want to be able to do that. How, you know, and, and, but he didn't, he, he neglected them all. And so she's angry. The idea is, what do I do if I'm an ambitious woman and I want to make films? Can I have a, a regular life as well? Um, and so that's the tension in there. And then the other one was The Lost Daughter. Did any of you see that? The Maggie Gyllenhaal one with Olivia Coleman. It's from an Elena. It was, uh, it was released um, on Netflix or something. It didn't have a theatrical opening as the other two did. But um, it's from an Elena Ferranti novel. And her, by the way, th those are wonderful films, I think, that they've made out of her. Neapolitan novels that are now on HBO. Um, this is a standalone one, though it has similar background and stuff. But in it, Olivia Coleman plays, uh, she comes to this, it's in the book, it's, it's in, I think she's in Greece and there are all these, Neo, she is someone who has escaped ne this horrible Neapolitan claustrophobic pulsating, fertile people, period, and is, is, is an academic uh, in, I think, in Florence in the, in the novel and in the book, she's English. So she goes to some, she's, she's teaches somewhere in 
Oh, she's gotten away from some market town in England and is now a sort of well-known academic. But she's there by herself, and her husband is with the two daughters, now grown in Canada. And it emerges during this thing that for one period, she just did resent being a mother. And at one point, she left her children and husband for three years. And so... What's interesting about the novel, I think it works better as a novel, is that it's all a, a conversation, an interior conversation. And she's she's sort of interrogating her own choices as a mother. And it's just all about ambivalence, which is, I think, what how else can it be for a woman that wants to have a career and also wants to have children? So it's I think this is a subject that I think is fascinating. And it was never you know, it never would have emer it never would have come up in the in the classical period or even the later even the later period. So I just was fascinated at these three films, and then I brought in others um, that deal with abortion. You know, now there's some films dealing with abortion because we're everyone's worried about what's going to happen with the Supreme Court. So it's an, a matter of some urgency. All of these things, and I think it's um, and of course these are mostly narratives driven by women, either written or directed by women. Uh, yes, Michelle. I just wanted to say, Molly, I am so happy to see you in person. I grew up in the village in the 60s, and every Thursday I would buy the Village Voice oh. to find out what movies to go to and what off-Broadway plays you were reviewing. Oh my goodness. It was a wonderful time. Thank you for remembering that. Yeah, I started as <laughs> I was I started as a theater critic at The Voice and I was the I was the low man on the totem pole. They were all covering off Broadway and I was doing Broadway cuz they said nobody wanted Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of the off Broadway plays were very raunchy. They were. <laughs> they really were. They were. <laughs> what was time, it? There was a, a magazine a uh, newspaper called Screw magazine. Oh yeah. And they rated everything in a number of penises. That's One, two, three, or four <laughs> the, penises. The, the Peter meters. <laughs> yes. It was very uh, funny. It was and raunchy. Funny. Yeah. And yeah. I, I mean, it really was sort of out there. I'm, I wrote for a magazine a couple of times called Viva. And it was this strange thing. Bob Guccione started it. It was a woman's magazine, but was supposed to be sort of, sort of the counterpart to Playboy. So they had pictures of male news in it, and yet it had it had some good writing in it. I mean, it was this funny combination. You can't imagine it today, but it was. Um, I tried to somebody call me. They were doing something on it. And I just had the hardest time trying to characterize it because it wasn't sleazy, but it wasn't dead serious either. It was something in between. It was grappling with. Um, well, if men can do it, why can't we, you know, if they look at us this way, why can't we look at them that way? But I don't know, somehow that <laughs> didn't really have a permanent, uh, I don't think it had a permanent influence, but great. I'm so glad you're, and you know, it was, I'm trying to write a um, memoir now um, that has this, its point of departure. What is it? This, um, the movie love in the 60s and 70s, because that was a fantastic period when you know, there really wasn't at that until that point, there wasn't a real canon of film criticism. It was just beginning to be taken seriously. Certainly American cinema was just beginning to be taken seriously. And there were cat, you know, dog, cat fights over auteurism. And as you know, all of those things, but it was just a, an incredibly kind of contentious, but also passionate time of, of, and it was a smaller world then, you know, it was just, now we have, there's so much, we're engulfed on all sides by, by things to see. And I mean, probably before, uh, you know, 30 years ago, if we were having this conversation, if I were doing this, probably we would have all seen the same films. Now there's just so much out there and whether it's a series, the series or this or that or the other, we don't have a, a sort of common fund of, 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 of movies that we've all seen as we probably would have then. I mean, of course, there's much, better in many ways now it's more diverse and more more voices it's you know all of these things but it's also harder to kind of uh i don't know that there's something i mean you've got twitter people arguing on twitter it's not quite the same thing you know <laughs> anyway so i also remember one day going to two movie theaters the art and the eighth street 
one after the others and see right. four different wonderful films. Yeah. One of which was the Philadelphia story and holiday and two others, but you couldn't do this nowadays. No, no, no. I mean, even the, <laughs> you know, the, the no theaters, I mean, the Sophia, we, we know this, I'm not telling you anything new, but theatrical film going is just, is just shrinking. And I mean, it's so wonderful when you do get that. I decided I wanted to see West Side Story. So I went to a theater and I just, I just loved it, even though there was hardly anybody there. It was just so great seeing it on the big screen. And that's that's gonna become a rare, I probably it'll just be IMAX and a few others. Um, that, that whole thing of just being with people and watching a film. I did have that experience this year with um, a Licorice Pizza, the, the Paul Th um, Thomas Anderson the name film which is just a lot of fun and it was and the critics weren't they, they they're so used to him doing these very ambitious films and I think this was felt slight but I thought it was just a real charmer but it was on 68th street yeah it was packed and everybody loved was loving the film and that was just such a great feeling you know that kind of sense of unanimity of discovering something because it really had just barely opened at that point so all of that I, I think we've lost something in that but um, at least movies are still going strong in one form or another. I guess we can be thankful for that. But not many places to read about. I mean, the, 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 uh, and that's the other thing. There were just uh, critics, everybody read each other and argued, you know, about whether it was Stanley Kaufman or John Simon or Pauline or Andrew. I mean, there were just all these arguments going on. But now it's all, everything is online and it's, it's just so diffuse. And plus the fact that people that write online, they, they go on it, they can go on indefinitely. So that it, uh, there's no editing, <laughs> I don't think, I don't know. But there's some very good people out there, but it's not the same thing where there was a kind of ongoing conversation. But I don't know. So has any, anybody got want to have a thought about anything they've seen this year? Oh, this year. Whether it could be a series or a film or anything. What do you like? What do you, what do people like? First best film? Anyone have want to make a reveal them themselves? I like the power of the dog. Yeah, I think that's gonna win. Um, I have to say that I wasn't, I've got to watch it again because. I, I love Jane Campion. I've loved all of her work. And I just was expecting to love it. I was expecting so much. I saw it at an early screening and I just felt it was a little bit heavy handed. But I think I think I do have to give it another chance because I think she was doing something really unusual. And it's it's sort of amazing that it's it's, it's had this popular uh, success in a way, because it's a sort of a dark film in a way and dark. And it has this sort of gay queer theme at the end and all that. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did anybody else vote for Power of the Dog? No. Yeah. Hmm. So nobody saw the, the 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 Lost Daughter then. That's um, I didn't like it that. I think it, the trouble is it just doesn't translate to the screen. It's one of these, as I said, interior monologues that are even an argument with herself. But I must say, Olivia Coleman is, is really incredible. But she can't. Well, the other thing I thought was interesting about the three movies that I discussed with Sight and Sound, Bergman Island, The Worst Person in the World, and the, the Olivia Coleman, is they're all sort of unlikable heroines. And I, thought, I think that's always interesting. I mean, they don't have to be um, just, you know, just aggressively awful, but just that, that they don't have to be charming. You know, they don't always have to be charming. And I always think that's a, a kind of a, kind of a great thing when women can do that. I mean, I think the looks thing is just it, as long as, I don't know how how we ever get past the fact that women are more involved with their looks and men are more you know, in, involved with what they do, their identity. But I think there are ways to kind of, I, oh, one thing I loved, I don't know if any of you saw Fleabag, have, has anybody seen that? Phoebe Waller. I love that show. She's perfect. Isn't it great? I think it's so, she is so wonderful in that. There's a wonderful encounter in one of the episodes where Kristen Scott Thomas is sort of the old school woman and Phoebe Waller Hogg is new. And Phoebe Waller is just, she doesn't know what to do. She's at this party and it's, should she come on to somebody? Should she, I mean, what, what you feel is 
what's scary in a way, and I think this is what this sex positivity, negative thing is, there are no rules. There are no sort of rules of courtship. There's no space to sort of, to, to get to know somebody and then think, well, maybe, maybe not. You know, it's sex first and then maybe you'll get to know each other and maybe not. And there was a whole kind of ground rules for, for um, encounters, male, female, maybe male, male too, female, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm talking mostly about heterosexual, but um, that's probably interesting too, when you think about it, the difference in gay and lesbian, anyway, another subject. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I Phoebe well I bet oh there's another great thing I loved one of the ones I love she's with her that wonderful sister and the sister has gotten this crazy haircut and Phoebe Wallhog is outraged so she says I'm going to go back to that salon I'm going to chew him out and so they go back and the guy said we don't know what he's got there and he's trying to kind of calm her down and do this and then he finally says something like well you know hair isn't that important and she says hair is everything <laughs> 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 and unfortunately i noticed this when we started lockdown everybody would go around the pajamas all day but my god they had they had to color their hair you know <laughs> i mean we're, we're just victims of our hair i'm afraid i don't think that'll ever change but maybe there are um more subtle i don't know I think I think certainly the, the idea of what is okay and acceptable for a woman to be and do has expanded enormously. There may still be you know, a few things with like hair and youth <laughs> that are a problem, but um, I think for the most part, and just seeing old age on the screen, I've seen like four or five movies recently about people with Alzheimer's. That some of them, I saw one called Vortex that I just was blown away by. I mean, I don't know if anybody's going to go see it because it's painful, but it's just so well done that the French movie. But so, I mean, you know, I think movies are certainly not shy about attacking controversial subjects. Uh, Paul Verhoeven, the one that did Basic Instinct, has a new one called, I think it's called Benedetta. It's about this 14th century lesbian nun. And it's just the wildest thing you've ever seen. And yet somehow it works. I don't usually like his films. They're just too kind of, you know, sort of willfully sensational. But this one is kind of kind of interesting. Charlotte Rampling plays a, the mother superior. It's just, I don't know. I think that will probably open at some point. Molly, I, um, just to say you'd asked about The Lost Daughter and that was a, I did see that and um, I read it just before I saw it and, uh -huh. um, and already an Elena Ferrante fan. So um, what did you uh, think? Uh, you know, the, your point about um, kind of the acceptability of um, a sort of a different or an evolving image of age and, and looks and women. I, I think to me, I really enjoyed watching a, the, the, uh, her last name is escaping me, but the Olivia, the actress. Oh, in, oh, um, yeah. Thank you. The yeah. um, I really enjoyed watching her because um, it was so refreshing to see sort of in so many ways, like, yeah, she's an actress, but she's also in some ways a real person yeah. um, visually. And I really enjoyed that. Um, the problem for me was exactly as you said, with all of the interior um, life of this main character, when other when other characters were speaking in the film, when other characters were sort of intruding, the conversation seemed so much more artificial or kind of, yeah. th they were almost frustrating because that interior life and that fascination watching her, her seemed like yeah. it was getting interrupted. And I was like, no, stay out of it. I, just yeah, I know, I know. Well, yeah. I almost thought it should have gone a little more into the horror film thing because things were happening. There was all this hostility and then the rock was falling on her and the whole thing with the doll. It, it really had a little bit of horror film uh, feel to it, I thought. Um, and she was good. I thought Ed, Ed Harris was good. I thought there were some good things in it, but well, I, I thought the family this Greek family from Queens just didn't work as the, as the equivalent of a Neapolitan family. But incident talking about that whole, I don't know, I, I mentioned earlier, my brilliant friend that this is I think now in his third season. And what is, I mean, everyone in that, I, I just hadn't, really, I'm gonna go back and start the beginning because I really didn't see it from the start, but you can really kind of come in anywhere, but I just wanna go back. But 
it is so real. I mean, those every character in it is just it, it real in a way that you, I don't know. I, I, I haven't found the words for it yet, but I like the two girls. I mean, if they, somebody, I was talking to somebody about it and they said, well, they're from the kind of place that Sophia Loren was. From. I said, no, no, no. You know, it's, it's what's great is they're not glamorous at all. You know, they're, they're so real. If you'd gotten a Sophia Loren like beauty in there, it would have just thrown the whole thing off. And I think American movies are guilty of, I think European is all, movies have always been better at having odd women, women they find, I think they find women attractive, like the Jolie led idea in ways that American cinema doesn't really. I think it's there's something just a little bit sort of juvenile and Puritan about it. Oh, what is this? Sorry, the animals are glad I'm home. It's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen any of the My Brilliant Friend? On you know, I haven't seen it. I've read them all. Um, yeah. I'm a librarian, so. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, I'm dying to see them because I do. I One of the things that I love so much about Elena Fronte's work is sort of the, the pace and the tone and kind of how things sort of have that, that slow burn development. Mm -hmm. And so it's intriguing to me to see what it's going to be like. So I'm, I'm waiting to You're find saving it, that up, really yeah. them all up. Yeah. yeah. Do you, do you like to watch, I mean, my friends all want to, are waiting till the end so they can watch them all together. I like to kind of space them out, but I, I seem to be alone in that. Most people like to binge and watch it, watch them all together. I, I would be good either way. Truth yeah. be told, I don't own a television. So I'm just, ah. it's just logistics for me. I can't wait to, to do it, whether I take them all out of the library or whether I, um, you know, just kind of find a way to watch them otherwise, but. Yeah. So do you have an iPad or something you can watch them on or how do you watch them? I, I, computer, I, mean. Netflix. I just have a Netflix um, uh -huh. subscription. So, yeah. Yeah. So, Probably things are off. on video. It's, once it sort of branches out, I'm, um, I just limit myself to Netflix. So, yeah. 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 All right. Well, anybody else? Let's see. What else did I say? A lot of, you know, another thing that's happened is kind of, I noticed this when I went to the New York Film Festival, there were just a lot of, well, the one of the film that I loved is Drive My Car, but that's the three hour Korean film, or Japanese film rather, um, that won my group, National Society of Film Critics Award. But it also brings in Chekhov. It's just, I love this director. He's sort of the new kind of hot Japanese director, but it is three hours and it is a you know contemplative film. I mean, things happen in it, but it's more contemplative. And I think it's amazing that it's gotten as far as it has. Um, another one that I loved is one called Petite Maman by Celine Sciamma. She did the one, I forgot the name of it, it came out a couple of years ago about this painter and her subject to women and their affair. It was That I thought was a little studied, but this one is about a child confronting her mother as a, as a, as a child. And it's sort of a metaphysical kind of twist, but it's, it's very warm and, and charming. And I don't know what else, Benedetta. I'll end this Drive My Car is on uh, uh, HBO now. Is it? And, and uh, yeah, I had to stop it halfway through because it was so long. Well, you I don't know, know if that's a good thing. It's fine. I, well, well, he has one called um, Happy Hour. It's five and a half hours. And I would just watch it and, and treat it like a series. In fact, it may actually have come out as a series as far as I know, but I would just like look at it a little bit and then go away and come back and look. And I think that's that's fine. No, you're not gonna get penalized for that. No. Okay, good. <laughs> I had a question. Um, I read an article recently that, and I don't remember exactly where, but Sam Elliott, came out and said he did not think Power of the Dog was a real Western or was not a Western and shouldn't be considered a Western. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you had seen that or had any thoughts on that or? Well, I did see it. Yeah, I, I wrote, I actually wrote about it for a film comment online and um, it's her kind of Western. I, I felt that it, to me, it was sort of heavy handed and this whole struggle between the gender, I said for the struggle for the gender of the house because you've got Jesse Plummer on one hand, who is wants civilization and you know, have people over, and then you've got Cumberbatch, who just wants, um, just wants it to be this kind of feudal mansion of nobody there. And then um, 
I think I, I felt it. I didn't feel the Westernness of it, but other people do. It's really interesting. People really disagree about this. I felt there was something ersatz about it. I'm not because it was filmed in Australia. I think you could do it in Western anywhere, but just everything was so portentous. I felt like, you know, it was going to be like a Sergio Leone film where Charles Bronson with his big eyeglasses was going to come over the hill. So it didn't persuade me as a Western, but it, it was written. The book is by a Western, uh, a guy who came out in the 50s and he, I think, was probably a uh, repressed homosexual or something because he had a marriage, like his story. Um, I don't know. I mean, some people just found it so powerful and I didn't, but, you know, um, and I was sort of disappointed because I, I wanted to like it, but I she doesn't need me. She's got, <laughs> it's got plenty of fans. So, <laughs> so do you think it'll win? Um. I would like for it to just because I like Benedict Cumberbatch, but yeah. I had actually one other question that relates to that, which is um, it keeps getting they people compare it almost automatically. It seems to me to Brokeback Mountain. Do you think that's a fair comparison, or is it just they're just grabbing it? I think this it's the uh, the gay only other gay western basically. I think that, I think that one is more obviously much more explicit, and I like that one. I, I like it very much. Um, I had some reservations at the time, but I've forgotten what they were. But this one is um, all mur murky and that ending is just so uh, sort of obscure. I mean, I, I really had to watch it twice to see what was happening. So it, it just, it very much does not bring, it doesn't bring the gay relationship to the fore. I, I mean, the, to me, the one, the scene that I loved in that was when Cameron Batch goes bathing and nude in that lake. And there's something so free about that moment. He's so free and he's so much at home. And that's the one time he, you feel that, because he's so ill at ease all the time. He, he can't get along with the other, he doesn't really get along with the other guys, the cowboys. He doesn't get along with the people in the, in the, in the at, you know, uh, Kirsten Dunst's Hope Mansion or whatever it is in. He just doesn't really get along with anybody, but there in that solitude, there was something primal that I, I really responded to. It's a little bit like the piano, which you respond to there, sort of wor wor sort of wordless, wordless things. Um, can I uh, interject yeah. something? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Carolyn, uh, and welcome to our our group. Thank you. I'm, I'm uh, enjoying being here. And a couple of us are members of NYWIC, New York Women in Film. Uh -huh. So you, know, you have a very nice cross section. Um, I, I saw the uh, Power of the Dog and I, I just wanna point out something about the Western. Uh -huh. I, I think the problem with the Western is that it has a very traditional format. Even, mm. even Broke Mac Mountain, there's the presence of cattle Mm -hmm. as a dominant factor in the activity Sergio Leone it's like a cattle thing and then mm -hmm. there's a western thing and there's a Mexican thing and there's mm -hmm. a gunfighting and what is not in those films is what you see in this film which is this is life in the plains or in the west mm -hmm. that's what people do yeah right this is how they live yeah. They don't have a glamorous life. They don't rescue. They don't have gunfights. All the they don't time. have gunfights. Yeah. They may use a gun to shoot a, a yeah. fox or something yeah. to protect their people or their livestock. But the reason it's not a, a Western, as Sam Elliott said, is because it isn't a that's Western. That's right. I think that's a really good point. Um, I think it doesn't fit the mold. And it, no, uh, because it's not an action film. Westerns are action films. And this is not. I mean, that's, that's the male, you know, it's the male. And the Westerns are all by men, pretty much. And they're all featuring men. And the domestic thing is very much uh, to the side and not, not, not usually not, not, that, not that important. Except, I don't know, John Ford Westerns are larger, I think. Yeah. They're not. They're not as uh, narrowly focused on the gunfight and so forth. But yeah, I think that's a good point. It's Western, including the sort of domestic life of people that live in the West. Yeah, and the tensions. Yeah, I think that's. And you're isolated. You know. Yeah. There's no. Um, it's a long way to church, 
It's a long way to school. You don't see movies. No. You don't see movies. Uh, maybe, maybe at some point, uh, these people in the, they might have had a radio. I can't remember the exact. Yeah, yeah. But th there's this other problem that I thought was interesting that when you have a little bit of money and you put your kid in a, on a train and they go to a boarding school, you know, like they go to an East Coast uh, right. uh, fancy school, fancy they school. come back exactly the, the incompatibility is is there that they're going to be isolated from yeah. the people who never left home or never left the yeah. the, the the farm or the, the ranch. Mm -hmm. So I, I can see why it would be um, considered a non-Western. Mm -hmm. Well, he obviously retreat. He he had that education. Cover that shit. I mean, I was shocked to discover somebody just mentions uh, offhand that he had a degree in classics and I thought what <laughs> you know, I just can't imagine him even reading but he's obviously rejected all of that somehow rejected yeah, well, I culture went school, I went to school with, with you know girl, young women who uh, you know grew up in Waco Texas yeah and they came to an east coast school but it was a lot of fun <laughs> how did they did they adapt did they did they suddenly want to come east or did they want to get back home uh the one from Dallas did not find it very much, very comfortable after Kennedy was shot. The one from Waco, mm -hmm. uh, or the two from Waco were fine. They just loved it. Uh -huh. They could get along um, anywhere. Yeah, they, yeah. they were very open-minded. Mm -hmm. So it would depend on-, on Yeah, the, the no, I think you're right. It's a, just a different kind of Western. It doesn't have the same tropes that we expect from a Western. Um, and I like Western. Uh, yeah, I do too. And I was, I was, I just happened to watch again the, the, um, I guess it was William Hurt. I wanted to see him in something. And so I watched the history of violence, the David Cronenberg film with Viggo Mortensen and, um, oh, Bella, what's her name? Bella, Maria Bello. And it's what I think it's wonderful, but it's also, it's like a Western in that it, it's mythological as well as, I mean, the violence is happening and it's real, but it's also, it's myth which is what you have in Leone and all these others, which you don't really have here. This is not, because it's not a myth that we know, you know, it, maybe it would be at some point, but it's not, it's a different take. Yeah, yeah, good point. Have, what I, have you I liked had, recently? Yeah. I had another thought, because I watch a lot of uh, TCM movies, you know, classics. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I look very closely at the credits and I realize that older movies have women often as screenwriters um and it seemed like there's an a, a, a more there were more screenwriters maybe not so much directors but mm -hmm. people in the in the the creation of the of the of the of the characters right I'm also wa watching a lot of french and uh, european tv series and the producers the directors mm. the key wow. people women's names it's just an observation. Yeah, um, we're not doing well by comparison. There's some really interesting. I think yeah. I I, yeah. I also observed from just reading bios of different directors, men directors, that when they started their careers in the United States, this is going back a ways. They often had come out of the army, mm -hmm. and the army had given them some opportunities to do uh, communications. Mm -hmm. And so when they got, look for jobs, everybody wanted a vet. So they got into TV when TV was on the ground floor. They, you know, moved on. So, and I know this Canadian and, and United States uh, directors. So women didn't have the leg up. Yeah. You know, they, they, didn't. they didn't have an internship. But they were influential and probably haven't gotten as much credit as they deserve. Somebody's just done a biography. It's about to come out. She wanted me to give it a blurb on Eleanor Glenn. Mm -hmm. And probably a lot of you probably don't even know who she was. But she was extremely famous in the beginning of the early part of the 20th century. She was British and sort of well born. And she wrote this scandalous novel about sex that everybody knew about. And they got her to Hollywood. And she was very instrumental. I think it was Jesse Lasky hired her. Everybody wanted to know her because what she did was she she could coin the whole thing of the it girl. Mm. And she understood somehow to, how, how to combine sex. And I mean, the way this tells it, I think it's a little too um, uh, too dialectical. I don't think it's quite like that, but the way she tells it is like she brought sophistication to cinema. Gloria Swanson was really kind of a rube and all these people. And so I don't think it was quite like that, but she definitely did 
bring some kind of polish and European savoir faire to the to Hollywood. Rudolph Valentino was one of her protégés. And I think she's long, her this biography is way overdue because she was really there in the beginning. And she did write too, but she more uh, more more was a kind of mentor in a way. She mm -hmm. did write. I don't think any uh, her screenplays were. I don't know how successful they were, but but more it was this kind of influence she had on how to deal with sex in the movies in a way, how to do it with some polish and you know. Thank you. That's interesting. Yes. Uh, yeah. Hi, Roberta. <laughs> nice to meet you. I think Women in Film is a great organization. My friend Joan Silver, I think, was a member for a long time. They're going to have a mm -hmm. memorial service for her at uh, Lincoln at Walter Reed Center in June, which is nice. She did Hester Street, as some of mm -hmm. you may know, oh, and wow. other things. Has anyone seen My Mother's Wound? Oh, what is that? My Mother's Wound um, takes place in S Serbia. Y-O-U-N-D, wound? Yeah, an yeah. 18-year-old often leaves to search for his family and he ends up working on this farm. And uh, really interesting. Is it? No one has seen it? Yeah, no one has oh, seen I'll it. Make a, I'll make a note of it. Yeah, it's really good. It's on YouTube now. I think I have heard of it. This title sounds familiar. Yeah, my, my mother's wound, like getting From, cut. Yeah, the wound. yeah, yeah. Not wound. Good. Yeah. Any other recommendations? Um, what did I just see? I see him and then I forget the next day. I can't remember the time. No, I know. I'm that way too. I, I see something. I make a list now. Yeah. I, I have to mark it to see if I <laughs> King Richard was kind of fun. Did anybody see that? About Richard, um, mm -hmm. saw, have, Serena, and, and, and what's her name? Serena. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was fantastic. Venus. Yeah. Venus. I thought, Will Smith is wonderful, I think. Yeah. Will Smith should win for that. Yeah. I thought he would have made a better Macbeth than Denzel Washington. I don't know if you <laughs> saw that, but if you're going to have a black Scottish <laughs> king, I thought Will Smith was very, no, I thought he was great in that. Everybody was good in that. Uh, there was also that um, one with Ruth Negga um, passing that was qu quite, I mean, it wasn't great, but it was quite good about the two black women. Mm -hmm. That was good. Uh, that was good. And directed by a woman also. What yeah. else? I, I'm probably the only person who cares about this, but I really liked Cyrano. I thought oh, did you? I haven't seen it. Did you? Okay. A lovely film, and it's a, it, there's some music. Uh huh. Dinklage is a fantastic actor. He's wonderful. Okay. He sings well. Okay. It's, it's kind of fun, and also it's a romance. It's it, teenagers would understand it. Yeah, it sounds um, like just the thing. And it has beautiful. It's beautiful. It's lovely to look at. Uh huh. Um, so I I would recommend it. Um, okay. Not because it's the greatest. Oh God, but it's film, fun. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. But it's a lot of fun. Very entertaining yeah. and beautiful. Um. Um, One that I liked is called Kimmy. It's about the new Steven Soderbergh film, K I M I, and Kimmy is a de is a device like like Alexa, oh. <laughs> uh, and Zoe Kazan is in. It's just really good and and sort of, I mean, he made it fairly quickly, but it just whole, I think it's just just fun. A lot of my some people don't like it, but most of my film my friends like it a lot. So Kimmy, I think it's on it's on one of the streaming services. What else? It's fun. Good to see a fun movie. But it doesn't have to be serious. Mm -mm. It, there was a series on uh, Netflix about the Hasidic Jewish mm -hmm. community in Israel. I think it's called Schneisel. Schneisel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw some you know, of that. It was very good. Yeah, it was. What did you think? Did anybody see Miss Maisel? <laughs> yes. Ah. <laughs> That's the way I felt, too. I mean, I know that period so well, and, you know, it just, you know. Yeah. How about the film noir Nightmare Alley? Well, no, the earlier one is just so much better. 
the earlier one is just lean and mean. It's 1947. Tyrone Power is fantastic. I think it's his best role. And it's just sort of a down and dirty film. I mean, it's really a crazy. Apparently, the book is really sordid, but it's a sordid story. And I think that, that, that Benicio de Toro is just, is just amplified it and weighed it down. I don't know. I mean, I love Bradley Cooper. I like the people in it. I just think I didn't like Kate Blanchett in it at all. I'm the woman that there's a really interesting woman in the earlier one who had a sad career. Um, but you, you, I didn't even know who she was when I first saw it. And I sort of looked into her. I can't even think of her name right now. Anyway, um, it's just black and white and long. I don't know. I, I, I just I think that sometimes it's not good to know if you know the earlier one, then this one has to seem kind of overproduced or something. But, yeah. you know, it's not bad. I don't think it's just it just uh, it's it's wrong for that kind of prop. Sort of, it should be a nasty little thing, you know. <laughs> the geek, yeah. Oh God. But and Belfast. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, okay. Um, I, I, my question is, why does Kenneth Branagh's film family so much cuter than he is? <laughs> 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 I mean, they're very appealing. They're very appealing. I don't know. I, I'm. I'm, I've never been a fan of him as a director and he's got the, this Agatha Christie, the um, death on whatever it is on the Nile coming up, which I'm sure is going to be dreadful. I did watch the earlier one, which is great fun. 1974, something like that with Peter Ustinoff as Poirot. It's one of the best. Ag I happen to be a big Ag Agatha Christie fan anyway, but mostly the movies, the stuff they do, uh, adaptations I don't really like very much, but this was great. Had a terrific cast. Who all is in it? Mia Farrow, Peter Ustinov. Um, I forgot, but I, I, I thought, hmm, oops. Why does it, do you get this little thing with faces that comes up with the rows and rows of yellow faces, smiling in people? Does that come up on your computer? <laughs> it's mm -hmm. a, oh, I have to get rid of it. Okay, guess not. <laughs> Won't learn how about that. Uh, I guess maybe we should close for now. What do you think? I've, it's really been fun. I'm getting a little hoarse. <laughs> We'll Great do it job. Again. Thank you. We'll do it Thank again. You. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank I'm you. To doing it again. Yeah, thank, okay. you. thank you. So, yeah. Thank you so much. You're a legend. Thank you. Thank you. Really yes. Thank you. I enjoyed it. We'll do it again and compare thank notes. You. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good, <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you Thank at the you movies. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> See you at that the was, movies. That was Gene Siskel's tagline, man. Right? <laughs> or take care. Right. Okay, she has left. If she's left, uh, we can have do something in order to save, save the uh, we'll stop recording. Recording. Make okay. sure you're on mute. Stop I am on. Oh, I'm not.